Yeah, Lee, I totally agree with you. And I don't like the outcomes of consolidation. Yep. But the consolidation has been rising yep. uh, many years since the 1970s. And there is only one big and most important and key reason for that. It's because the consumers are making decisions based on price to purchase their goods. And then it comes to two things, income available, mm -hmm. that there are many countries struggling to keep up with productivity and the wages in real terms, they are not growing. Mm -hmm. So the households need to be purchasing cheaper things. So it's a macroeconomic thing that Europe and mainly need to address. And from another perspective, we come again to the point where I mentioned that consumer awareness needs to be something that we should be addressing because consolidation only takes place because only takes place because the produce, the consumers are always shopping around and going for the cheapest, most convenient uh, alternative that are around in all the product segments, not only coffee. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forwards Workshop. It's time to become a coffee consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode four of a five-part series where we're talking about the volatility in the coffee supply chain. We're focusing a lot on price because price seems to be the thing that is most impacted by the volatility and the risk that exists in the supply chain. And in this episode, we're talking about how production costs are impacting producers. And in this series, we have Fabricio Andrade from San Coffee. And Fabricio, the thing that is a constant uh, point of discussion is what is the cost of production? And I recently got asked by somebody, they said to me, uh, I want to buy coffee for a good price. When I said to him, what does a good price mean? He said, a little bit less than what my um, competitors are paying. And, and he said to, you know, my face kind of screwed up and he said, why, what's wrong? What's a good price? And I said, well, the starting point of understanding what a good price is, is understanding what the producer you're buying the coffee of, what their cost of production is. And it really surprised me that again and again and again, when anybody is talking about pricing, the starting point of understanding what the pricing is is not understanding what the producer's cost of production is. That doesn't seem to be the starting point. Why do you think that is? Yeah. I, uh, Lee, oh, uh, first of all, uh, hello again in the <laughs> fourth episode. Uh, that's a, a really interesting uh, point, and I don't know how to start it. But in the end, there are many people uh, producing, import, exporting, importing, roasting, selling it into the supermarkets. And the supply chain is so big. And, and there complex. are eventually people that really don't understand uh, that coffee comes from producers. And they are more concerned about making a living as like all the human beings are. Mm -hmm. And... The first point is sometimes it's out of knowledge that they don't necessarily know how producers are heavily impacted by the price they are paying for coffee. So that's the first point. Eventually, it's something naive that I'm telling, but I honestly really believe that there are many people that don't really know what happens in the producing side. Uh, and the second uh, point is I also see that roasting, selling coffee, importing, it's also kind of a jungle. There are a lot of competitiveness into these yes. segments as well in the supply chain. And everybody has its own families. Everybody has its own 
co-workers to be paid. Everybody has its own dreams to grow the company. And everybody wants to do that, to handle properly that trade-off in between paying the producers more and having a larger margin. So that's the second point. And in the end, I, I'm not saying that business can sort everything out and address all the problems in the on the earth. But whenever we come up to the mainstream, many people working together, many uh, different perspectives, many different expectations, many different ethics, different cultures, I believe the business uh, mindset and structure helps. So what may, I'm saying is uh, what we need to be thinking about prices are prices that will be able to sustain coffee production into the long term. And then the cost of production take place. And then I believe it's a multi-dimensional uh, solution for everything taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, but the most important thing is to get the producers. And again, it's not easy to do that. Mm -hmm. And there are countries that are way more complicated than it is in Brazil or in Colombia and so forth. It's all different. But in the end, the long-term solutions need to come out of knowledge and awareness uh, from the producers that there will be times the prices will be lower than their cost of production, then they will need to be prepared for it and they need to be strong with cash, with good yields, with good strategy hands. Collect alone or collectively within mm -hmm. cooperatives to to be able to go through these bad times in uh, in the market and the prices, and then they can go through all these challenges that will be temporarily uh, taking place. But then the second thing is that I mentioned before is to try as a and as an industry, then the consuming side can help us a lot which is to bring more awareness into the consump consumption side, that there will, be, there will be along the time more consumers willing to pay more for their co cup of coffee because there will be a lot of impact down upstream wards into the supply chain. So I see the solutions, the most sustainable ones in, into these dimensions, preparing the producers and bringing more awareness to the consumption side that what takes place into the supply chain and that their consumption and purchasing habits will be having a huge impact upstream wide into the, into the supply chain. So in my opinion, it, it would go uh, in these both uh, ways. The Do we have time? Future. Given the volatility that's already and the stress that's on producers, do we have time to wait to educate people? Le <sighs> I don't think so. There will be many people, unfortunately, being left behind because you will mm. not be able to get access to all of them. But I don't believe there would be, at this moment, other alternatives because we are seeing that many policies that have taken place into the past, they haven't worked really well because we are seeing a lot of concentration into coffee production in Brazil, Vietnam, and so there are many countries, beautiful coffees, uh, being less competitive into the marketplace, which is really bad. So we are seeing, I, I'm not saying countries' names because every, every one of yeah. them produce great coffees and there are many people depending on coffee to live there. So we are seeing these coffees, these producing countries not being able to improve and to grow their production. So that's something wrong that we need to 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 try to sort out and to address. And in my opinion, it needs to be by awareness from the consumption side, mm -hmm. because the consum consum consumers, they are the ultimate source of revenue to the supply yeah. chain. So if we don't convince them, there will be something wrong. There will need to be subsidized, subsidies. And subsidies, they don't work really well in the long term. Mm -hmm. And then we need to get the growers prepared to make their decisions along the way and get prepared for good and bad times that will certainly come and hit them. And at, the, at this point, what's unfortunate is that we 
face the risk of what comes next if producers decide that this is too hard, which is a consolidation. And if consolidation starts to become a thing, and for folks who don't know what that means, if a producer decides that he doesn't want to produce coffee anymore, uh, a big company could come in and decide to acquire their farm. And then his neighbor decides that he doesn't want to sell coffee or produce coffee anymore. And the same big company like hmm, the Nestle's and the, the, the all the big, big companies who are buying up agricultural land to secure their supply chains, they just start buying up fa- farmland. This has happened in a lot of countries around the world. And then the ultimate situation that we have there is that big, massive enterprises own the food supply chain and they get to determine the price of everything. They get to determine the quality of everything. They get to determine whether we use pesticides or we don't use pesticides or whether it's worth investing in organic farming or not. And they impact policy. Like it just, it, it, it's, it's a nightmare. I don't want us to head in that direction, which is why it, it serves us to be paying producers the right price. Yeah, Lee, I totally agree with you. And I don't like the outcomes of consolidation. But the consolidation has been rising uh, many years since the 1970s. And there is only one big and most important and key reason for that. It's because the consumers are making decisions based on price to purchase their goods. And then it comes to two things, income available, Mm -hmm. that there are many countries struggling to keep up with productivity and the wages in real terms, they are not growing. Mm -hmm. So the households need to be purchasing cheaper things. So it's a macroeconomic thing that Europe and mainly need to address. And from another perspective, we come again to the point where I mentioned that consumer awareness needs to be something that we should be addressing because consolidation only takes place because only takes place because the produ- the consumers are always shopping around and going for the cheapest, most convenient uh, alternative that are around in all the product segments, not only coffee. And I feel that I I agree with you, like the consumer, the consumer has a problem. They believe that instant coffee is coffee and it's the same as the other things that we call coffee. You know, the coffee that they buy in a specialty coffee cafe is not the same kind of coffee as what they buy in a tin from Nestle, Nescafe. But they, because we call them both, both coffee, we have a branding problem for the term coffee. And exactly, this is leaning into the issue of the price of coffee. Do you know uh, a Nes, Nes Cafe or Nestle, I'm not sure if the parent company or the brand released a number. Do you know how many cups of coffee uh, Nestle sells every second? I have no idea, but I believe it's a lot. 6,000. <laughs> 6,000 cups of coffee per second. And now, I mean, the reason that that's a big problem is because about six or seven years ago, I had someone from ideation in Nestle on the podcast and that number was 3,000. So it it really does lean into it, right? It's a big leap because when we talk about volatile times, we're not just talking about volatile times for the producer. We're not talking about volatile times just for the roaster or the cafe owner. The consumer is a part of this supply chain and their buying philosophy as a consumer heavily impacts where they end up spending their money. And now if they're spending their money on Nescafe rather than at a specialty coffee shop or with um you know, any kind of a local neighborhood cafe, what that ends up meaning is that Nestle is going to have more money to be able to go and consolidate these farms. So it's a redistribution of power back into the corporates rather than into the people who will grow, more likely to grow coffee in a more sustainable way. And it it just, it's a recipe for disaster and more consolidation. 
So yeah. it's a challenge. Yeah, uh, I'm seeing it, consolidation reaching even, like I said, the last uh, uh, step in the supply chain or the first one, which is mm. the the producing producing uh, production of coffee and it's happening. Yeah. Lee, I have spoken to many people about it in many countries and again, about awareness into the consumers being so important. Yeah. And I asked these people, hey, uh, against whom have you benchmarking your business? And someone comes to me and said, I've no longer been uh, benchmarking my business within supply chain, within coffee roasters. I've been benchmarking my business within Why? other industries like tea or wine or whatever yeah. it is. And I said, okay, good point. And tell me what we can learn out of, uh, for many people, what we can learn out of these uh, cross-sectional uh, benchmark you were doing. And I said, the first thing that coffee industry would be benefiting a lot is narrowing the gap that there is in between experts and regular consumers in coffee, which is way wider than it is in wine, for example. That's a really good point, but again, it takes time, and I don't know, like you, we, if I'm we not sure that we have time. it. Right? Yeah, like, that, I'm, yeah. Well, I'm not sure if we have the luxury, uh, given that so many producers. For when you look at the price of coffee, it hasn't changed that much over 30 years. Yeah. That actually, in real terms, it decreased, right? In real terms, it decreased, and the inputs have gone up, and the cost of doing business have gone up. The cost of production has gone up. The, the 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 risk that producers have to carry is so much higher. Um, and given that we're going into this year and next year with so much geopolitical pressure and, I mean, producers who want to get ships through the Red Sea, that's just one example of the volatility that is a problem right now. Then we haven't even started talking about EUDR. You know, that's that's a whole other <laughs> level of all of it, At which, you know, we've got one more episode, so it might come up in that. But the, the, the thing is, like, these kinds of times create great opportunity, but the reality of it is it, they create mass change because the way that we've done things before is not going to be the way that we're going to be able to continue. There's too many forces right now when you look at the rate that technology is accelerating, the rate that currencies themselves are shifting, the rate that, that policy is changing around the world, it, climate change is accelerating. I don't think the world's going to look the same in 10 years as it does right now, particularly for something like commodities. I don't know. We'll see. Yep. Totally true. We will. We have one more episode to go, folks, and in that we're going to talk about cash flow and liquidity and the way that it is uh, used in running a coffee farm. We may talk about AUDR, uh, but we may have to save that for a whole other series. Join us in the next episode. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon, and stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.